Genetic resources for food and agriculture are practically the building blocks. Uh, like building blocks means they act as a feedstock, you know, for the de development or manufacturing of a particular product. You know, like we use bricks for making a building, or you use any small ingredient for making a particular product. So these genetic resources, which is the nature's gift, you know, to us, are utilized as feedstocks or as building blocks for what we eat for what we consume, for the very survival of the human beings or human race and all other living organisms on the planet Earth. So without these genetic resources, the very planet will not exist and there will not be any kind of a quality or quantity of the food, the diversity which you require, not only for your food, even for your shelter as clothing you know, and various other applications. We should try to use these genetic resources for complementing our needs, uh, particularly with regard to the quality, nutritional quality, for some of those essential amino acids which we are not able to synthesize ourselves in the human body, but we normally depend on all the times on these plant genetic resources, you know, for essential amino acids. So this could be one example in you know for the consumers that we should try to consume as much these diverse foods because they are rich in different phytonutrients, different vitamins, you know, or beta carotenes, etc. And we should try to take the advantage, you know, for, for the well-being of our, our cells. We must play a key role as farmers in conservation of all these genetic resources. I am talking particularly of plant genetic resources because they come in various diverse forms. And they have all those genes and alleles or all those useful traits which tomorrow we would require it, you know, for utilization of the tools of science through pre-breeding or through plant breeding activities. And therefore, we would suggest and, and advise and, and together with farmers ourselves, the message would be to conserve this diversity. And also now since we have these regulations. Uh, we have these excellent international and national instruments available for protecting the, the varieties of the farmers. So I would even suggest that the farmers should come forward, try to get their varieties protected in the form of registration by a national legislation like we have in India, for example, Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers' Rights Acts. And we should try to honor the farmers. We should try to, in fact, reward those farmers who have spent their lifetimes. You know, not only the, the farmers directly themselves, even their forefathers, who have been preserving, you know, all this natural wealth, I would call it, you know, for, for ages. And if we can try to reward those farmers, you know, and, and try to bring back, you know, what we have lost, for example, you know, from one region or the other and try to revive it. So the farmers, they have been always playing a key role and I'm sure they will continue to play a key role further and because now even the governments across the world are, are protecting these, these, you know, farmers. Uh, you know, varieties and, and other, you know, kind of processes, the traditional knowledge which, which they have been carrying over from generation to generation. So I think uh, this is an opportunity uh, as the FAO or the Commission on Genetic Resources for, for Food and Agriculture, they have been doing an excellent job in, in, in advising the various, you know, nations and the countries and to protect, you know, these farmers' varieties, etc., etc., will be very, very useful at the farmers' level and for the nation as a whole and for the whole planet. The wheat plants, you know, uh, which were there at the time cultivated in early 60s or before 1960s, were tall enough. You know, they will uh, were very lanky with the thin stem, and if there is any kind of a problem of rain or or strong wind, particularly the time when they have got the ears formed, they will be lodging all the time, and farmers will not be able to harvest much advantage, you know, out of it. But then uh, Norman Borlaug, you know, took an challenge, took a challenge and, um, and you know, went around the world to see what could be done and he fortunately found one of the genetic resources of wheat in Japan named as Norin-10, which was quite dwarf, very small in size. 
And uh, so as a plant breeder, Norman Borlaug brought it to Mexico and Simit and he made a cross, you know, of this tall variety with this very small variety of wheat. And the resultant was a kind of, a, um, you know, a dwarf wheat, we call it, not as dwarf, but kind of, a, you know, dwarf wheat, which was highly productive and, uh, and which as a result gave, you know, four to five tons per hectare real advantage against only about one to two tons, which were there with this t tall variety. So therefore, that was a burning example in mid 60s and early 70s, you know, when um, we came out of famine and, you know, of, of this, sh sh you know, shortages of food, uh, you know, which was there prevalent in India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, all that area. And, and uh, but now as a result of this use of plant genetic resource of wheat, particularly, we became self-sufficient in food security, you know, in that region. And today, India, one of the biggest examples of, of this uh, green revolution is able to export even to other countries and we are able to even uh, have food storage you know um, for for any kind of a natural calamity if, if taking place